Buenas tardes, good afternoon. I am Dr. Judith Flores Carmona, Interim Director for Chicano Programs at New Mexico State University. Happy Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, well observed over uh, various states across the country. Um, we are very honored today to have a fabulous speaker um, all the way from Arizona. Um, I would like us to start with a land acknowledgement, even though they might be a little problematic because we're actually acknowledging that we are on stolen land, but we're not giving it back. Uh, but we want to recognize that um, NMSU is a, a public institution that is located on the ancestral and current homelands of 23 <laughs> indigenous uh, peoples. Um, uh, ancestral lands and they have lived here before you know we were all here i want to recognize that um that we are in we are guests on territorial land of the southwest indigenous peoples that include the pueblo navajo and the apache peoples i want to acknowledge also and respect the sovereign indian nations and indigenous peoples as a mexicana border crosser uh, um, I honor these knowledges and worldviews, and I'm very, very thrilled for today's um, speaker. Um, I invite each of you who to also acknowledge uh, the lands on which you stand and from where you are connecting with us today. Um, and lastly, I want to uh, acknowledge the support that we have received for today's um, talk. Um, which is part of, of course, Indigenous Peoples Day, but also Latinx Heritage Month. Um, thank you to American Indian Programs, the Borderlands and Ethnic Studies Graduate Certificate, the Office of the Vice President for Equity, Inclusion and Diversity, which is a brand new office here at NMSU, the Honors College, the College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Office, and the College of Arts and Sciences Stan Fulton Endowed Chair. Muchas gracias. I now introduce you and turn it over to my dear Femtor, one of the very first people that uh, valued my presence at NMSU, Dr. Jeanette Haynes Ryder, who is a professor of curriculum and instruction in the College of Health, Education, and Social Transformation at NMSU. Her areas of specialization include tribal critical race theory, critical multicultural education, social justice education, indigenous education, and Native American identity and teacher education. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am uh, Jeanette Haynes Ryder. I'm a citizen of Cherokee Nation of uh, Oklahoma, but I've been uh, a guest on these lands since 1996 or actually before. And so I wanted to speak to you just a little bit about Indigenous Peoples Day, opening with these words. Since time immemorial, American Indians, Alaska Natives and Native Hawaiians have built vibrant and diverse cultures safeguarding lang land, language, spirit, knowledge, and traditions across the generations. These words come from a proclamation on Indigenous Peoples Day of 2021, issued Friday by U.S. President Joe Biden. It's the first time such a proclamation has been issued by a U.S. president. What is Indigenous Peoples Day? Indigenous Peoples Day is a change in the national narrative of Columbus's discovery of the new world. To acknowledge Indigenous peoples as the first Americans who called and still called these lands and territories home. Indigenous Peoples Day is a movement toward rectifying a sanitized history of erasure of Indigenous peoples and inaccuracies about us to having a more complete picture of our, and I mean all of us, of our history, both good and bad, as messy and as complex as it is. Many cities across the US observe Indigenous Peoples Day and approximately nine states observe Indigenous Peoples Day instead of or alongside Columbus Day, New Mexico being one of them. 
In fall of 2018, New Mexico's recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday of October was passed first by the Associated Students of NMSU and then by the NMSU Faculty Senate with the recognition of the first Indigenous Peoples Day occurring in 2019. But our work is not over by any means. For those of you with us today, especially our viewers uh, coming from New Mexico, we need to ensure that the histories of indigenous peoples in what is now New Mexico is included in meaningful ways in the public school curriculum. A recent rewriting of the New Mexico Social Studies Standards has taken place, and now we have time for open public comment through the New Mexico Public Ed Department website. I ask you to make public comment in support of the proposed standards. I also ask that you consider signing a petition to help us form a Department of Ethnic Studies here at NMSU so we may further build our capacity to educate at the university level. Please contact me or Dr. Judith Flores Carmona or other faculty from the Borderlands Ethnic Studies program to access the petition. But we are so pleased and we are very appreciative that you joined us in observance of Indigenous Peoples Day. In our observance today, please help ensure our Indigenous presence is not available only on one day of the year. Help ensure that the scholarly information shared today by scholar such as Dr. Conroy Ben becomes part of the curricular norm for a historically literate citizen. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Georgina Bodoni. I will let her introduce herself in her department and her scholarly specialties, Dr. Bodoni. Thank you, uh, thank you. Georgina Bodoni Yinishia, not Otanet, Hachin Yinishne, Kilinchine Pashishin, Nipitone Dashche, Kenya Ane Dashanella, Okotego Sanishne. She a um, assistant professor Nishna here at New Mexico State University in Native American Studies, and um, I have the wonderful pleasure of of introducing our guest today, Dr. Conroy Ben, who is an assistant professor of environmental engineering in the School of Sustainable Engineering and the Built Environment at Arizona State University. She received a BS in chemistry from the University of Notre Dame and an MA in chemistry and a PhD in environmental engineering from the University of Arizona. Her research includes tribal water quality, water waste epidemiology and water waste treatment and emerging unregulated contaminants. A descendant of Ogallala Chief Smoke and Red Shirt, um, Otake is, her, is the first in her family to receive a college degree she proudly represents the Lakota on um, powwow circuit and fancy shawl dancer and as Miss Black Hills Nation. Um, so without further ado, I will um, let our, our guest um, introduce herself and uh, present her work. Thank you. I'd like to thank the faculty and staff at M NMSU for the invitation to speak on today, Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I'm very honored that um, I get to share a little bit about myself with you. And um, I hope you uh, enjoy my presentation. And if there are any questions about any of my work, um, those questions will be relayed to me. Let me see, can I share my presentation? Okay. Am I able to share? It should be. Okay, let's see. It says I'm not able to. Kevin, Kevin can you please make her co-host? Okay, thank you for that. Okay, um, so today I want to talk to you about my experiences being a Native person in science and engineering. Um, as stated before, my name is Okakuye Conroy Ben, uh, and I am an environmental engineering professor here at Arizona State University. 
this is me, uh, where I come from. My Lakota name is Pitakuye Otawi. I am Ogallala Lakota from Pine Ridge, South Dakota, from a small community called Porcupine. In my immediate family, I'm the oldest of five children. And uh, I generally grew up in Rapid City, South Dakota. Fancy child dancer. The picture in the lower left shows when I was Miss Black Hills Nation and uh, had responsibilities such as sharing my culture, promoting the local powwow, um, and really interacting with the public. And a little unknown or maybe a known fact about me is that you can see me in Dances with Wolf. I was a teen actor over 30 years ago and uh, also acted in several other movies. And I would not be here today without the strong support of my family and friends, as well as mentors. Uh, this picture here shows my parents and my oldest daughter when she was younger. Um, I married to Dr. Colin Bent, who was a colleague of uh, Dr. Carmona's um, when they were at, at Utah. We have two daughters. Wayuita uh, is the older one and the younger one is Denea. And um, you know, my family and friends, they're really there to support me, um, not only allowing me just to go out and you know, take trips to present my research or to sample, um, but just to really talk about you know, some of the struggles and even the highlights that uh, I go through as a woman in engineering and then as a native person in higher education. And so I wanted to share a little bit of some statistics for uh, American Indian Alaska Native students or Indigenous students who are on and the state of higher education for them in the STEM fields. We all know that uh, American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, other Indigenous populations are underrepresented in nearly all fields. And that if you are black indigenous or person of color, uh, you're, as a student, you will perform better when you have mentors and faculty who come from similar backgrounds and share the same experiences with you. It doesn't really hold for students only, but even as faculty member, uh, as faculty members, um, it's really important to have uh, you know, people there who have gone through what, what you will go through. So I pulled this late last night um, from the National Center for Education Statistics. And I went through the National Science Foundation portal to download this data, talking about bachelor's degrees. In the upper right is a graph showing um, a bachelor's degrees conferred and broken down um, by race. And uh, you'll notice on the y-axis is the number of students, and that is a log scale. So you'll see um, big changes um, in the y-axis there. And then the x-axis shows the breakdown of race that was reported for the years 2008 to 2018. Um, and basically, uh, American Indian and Alaska Native degrees conferred make up around uh, from the trends I saw about 0.5% of all degrees, um, which is lower than what is actually represented in higher education. Um, American Indians and Alaska Natives account for about 1% of the overall students who attend um, higher ed or bachelor's, um, master's and PhD programs. And then uh, in this data set, they broke it down by all majors reported. Uh, but what I'm going to show you are just general non-science and engineering degrees in the lower left, science degrees in the middle, and engineering degrees on the right. And again, what we see are that American Indian, Alaska Natives make up about 0.5 of other non-science and engineering degrees. So humanities, history, um, business, and so forth. Uh, what I also noticed 
uh, and you, you can see it here on the screen, is that in general, uh, all races um, had degrees conferred that were increasing over time with the exception of um, indigenous students, which was, it's discouraging. Um, I have not uh, seen that trend, um, um, but is shown here. So um, when it comes to science degrees, again, uh, most races are trending upwards, but American Indian Alaska Natives are staying flat since 2008 and same with engineering. And so um, what this data is telling us is that um, there are indigenous students who for some reason um, are not pursuing higher education at the same rate, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And it's really important to try to figure out why that is happening. And then if we look at uh, master's degrees, um, conferred during the same time period. The uh, level of students attending master's degree programs and getting degrees is about the same. It's about 0.5% of the total domestic um, population. This data set doesn't include uh, international students who are attending graduate school. Um, but again, it's about 0.5%. Um, there aren't really any major trends here. Um, it looks like everyone is increasing in the sciences. Um, as far as non-science and engineering, the levels are flattening out. Sorry about that. And then for engineering, the percent of indigenous students attending these programs and graduating is less. Uh, it varied, fluctuated from year to year. Um, but uh, the trend is less than what is observed for other um, races. And then we look at um, PhD uh, degrees conferred during this time period. And overall uh, for indigenous students, um, they made up 0.35% of the total PhD degrees again, uh, lower than that uh, uh, traditional 0.5%. Um, this is at the PhD level. For non-science and engineering, the um, value was 0.45%. And then for science and engineering, uh, for a few years during this time period, data was not reported. Um, and that was because the data was um, undisclosed to um, for uh, non-identifying purposes, um, whatever that means. And so uh, we don't quite have all the data for PhD uh, degrees for American Indians, um, but overall in science and engineering, um, we make, about, make up about 0.3% of PhD degrees conferred during this time period. So all of these degrees um, hopefully lead up to a faculty position. And so I pulled also from the same database a summary um, done by uh, another education statistics group that shows the level of the um, uh, professor professorship or the academic rank broken down by race and gender. And uh, you'll see that you know most of academia is generally uh, white, male and female. And when you break it down further and look at American Indian Alaska Native, um, it was not broken into male, female simply because there were not enough numbers there um, to disaggregate that data. And in the um, summary statistics, we make up less than 1% of uh, higher education faculty. And so uh, with that, um, I, you know, when I was an undergrad and when I was a grad student, I never thought about getting into higher education. I never thought about becoming a professor. Um, I just didn't, 
I saw how stressful it was and I didn't want to uh, do that type of work. I wanted to be in the field and I wanted to research. But as I progressed through grad school and then a postdoc, I saw that I had the freedom to really study what I wanted to study, as well as to make an impact in higher education when it comes to teaching curriculum development, and then just making decisions um, for other service related activities. And so this is, you know, the general layout, there uh, definitely needs to be more indigenous faculty in all fields. Uh, I come from an institution at ASU where uh, the environment is supportive, in, in my view. We have about 60 American Indian faculty here, which is great. Um, and we're serving one of the largest Native student bodies in the country. I want to say we're close to 4,000 American Indian students. Um, so it's a very... Um, uh, it's, it's creating an environment that, that's supportive for American Indians. Um, and so it, what I want to talk about next is kind of that trajectory. Um, you know, how did I get to this point? And, um, you know, what are the next steps? What are the next steps for you? Okay, um, so I went to the University of Notre Dame um, as an undergrad, I studied chemistry. I was very strong in the sciences and math. So it was a natural fit. Uh, I enjoyed my time there. During the summers, I did some research and I'll talk about that in the next slide. For graduate school, uh, I wanted to get away from chemistry. I wanted to make a difference in my home community. Uh, and with chemistry, I felt that it was too narrow. So I switched to engineering. And I went to school at the University of Arizona and I got a PhD in chemical and environmental engineering. And during the summer, uh, one of the summers I worked at the US Geological Survey. Once I graduated, uh, I had several job offers from many different sectors, tribal college, um, research one university, uh, postdoc consulting, and I settled on being a research engineer at the LA County Sanitation Districts. And that's because I wanted some practical engineering experience before moving on to my ultimate career. I then moved on to a postdoc at, uh, back at the U of A. Uh, and I did that in biochemistry. And also while I was there, I wanted to get some teaching experience. So I taught at Pima Community College in the mathematics department. I then accepted a position at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City in civil and environmental engineering. And then uh, my husband and I left and we ended up at Arizona State University um, where I still focus on environmental engineering. And so this slide here shows really what got me into research. And so I'm in my field because I like to teach and I like to do research. So during two summers while I was at Notre Dame, uh, I applied to a summer research program that was funded by NIH. This was the Native American Alcohol Research Center. And in the particular lab I was working uh, in, we were looking for the genetic basis of alcoholism. This is a really interesting um, approach they were doing. They had, um, acquired some mice that reacted differently when they were given alcohol. And these were called short bread, uh, short sleep mice, long sleep mice. So uh, one strain of mice, uh, when they were given alcohol, they would sleep. And the other strain of mice didn't sleep, they just acted normally. And so um, what this lab was doing was they were sequencing the DNA to see if there were any genes that were causing this type of response. And this was my first experience with research and I loved it. I loved working in the lab. Um, I thought their research question was interesting and I was learning new techniques. So we're sequencing mice DNA. And this is the old school way of sequencing. Uh, this is rarely done nowadays with next generation sequencing. 
Um, but I learned quite a bit about molecular biology, how my chemistry could be applied into something um, useful and health-based. And this resulted in me getting a research position in the lab after I graduated. So I worked in the lab for two more years and I ended up getting on some publications, which really helped me um, get into uh, some top programs in grad school. Um, also related to my career path today is my postdoc research experience. Um, when I was in grad school, one of my chemistry professors told me to do a postdoc in a field that's unrelated to what you're studying. Um, and that's because you want to really get some um, breadth in your research. And I would say that all the different disciplines of academia are really interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary. And so I wanted to just get some new experiences. So I did my postdoc in biochemistry. I was looking at metal resistant bacteria, specifically E. coli. I was looking at how some proteins interacted with each other and were responsible for E. coli being resistant to copper and silver. Um, and this was really interesting. I learned more about you know, microbiology, biochemistry, molecular biology, and this really helped me secure some early uh, funding in my assistant professor positions. And so when you look at the academic world, uh, depending on the type of position you have, there are many types of positions. You know, you could be a lecturer, you could do um, just research only and be a research uh, faculty member, or um, I would say what's more common is uh, a tenure track position where you are working um, up the ranks of uh, the faculty ladder, going from assistant to associate to full professor and then the distinguished professorships. So as an assistant professor, uh, depending on you know, your institution type, if you're research focused or maybe you're only undergrad focused, you'll have a breakdown of different responsibilities. And so um, here at ASU, I have teaching research and service responsibilities um, and it's broken down by a percentage, um, but basically teaching and research um, are equivalent to each other. I teach undergrad and graduate courses in intro to environmental engineering, groundwater remediation and environmental organic chem. On my research side, uh, you know, I'm really passionate about what I do. Um, uh, I have to bring in grant money and I have to publish. And then as part of that, I'm mentoring undergraduate and graduate students. And I'll talk more about my research in, in a few slides. And then service, uh, you're, you need to do service within your department at the university level, um, nationally, as well as internationally. Um, so I've done a number of different things. Um, I think everyone on the panel, everyone who's uh, who were in the introductions can attest that uh, we have a lot of service placed on us um, uh, as people of color, as women. And so uh, I'm being more selective. Uh, I'm trying to get that service, the service experiences that are going to make a change in the field, um, but would also, um, you know, help me in my career trajectory. So I'm uh, uh, on an EPA Science Advisory Board, a National Academies Committee. Um, and then I'm working on some publications for uh, climate change assessments. So this is a summary slide of what I do. Um, I call myself a wastewater engineer. It's not glamorous at all. Um, it has all that ick factor that comes with it. I've studied all aspects of wastewater from sewer odors at the LA County Sanitation District. Um, I worked at the JWPCP Joint Water Pollution Control Plant in Carson, California. Uh, the surrounding public doesn't wanna smell wastewater. I don't blame them. Um, so my job was to try to mitigate that sewer odor. Um, I've worked uh, at 
uh, when I was a grad student at the University of Arizona, um, I studied the discharge coming from wastewater treatment facilities uh, in the Tucson area and looking at how emerging pollutants, endocrine disrupting chemicals are removed during wastewater treatment and then what happens when they get discharged. And this was important, you know, 20 years ago, especially when municipal municipalities were considering uh, plans for wastewater. Uh, can they re reuse it? Um, and so my role was to figure out what are the health aspects if it gets reused. Um, other aspects of wastewater in the upper left, um, there is a Maori community I consulted with a few years ago where they were concerned about the wastewater discharge coming out of a stream and into one of their lakes. Um, so I read their environmental impact statements and provided guidance on some questions that they, the community needs to be asking utilities as well as university researchers. And then I have some more um, applied sciences and looking at antibiotic resistant genes uh, in wastewater and then how we can use uh, proteins to clean up water. And so this is one of the um, projects coming out of my master's and PhD. In the map, uh, this shows Tucson um, and, and the Santa Cruz River, which flows in a northwesterly direction. You'll see the black squares show two wastewater treatment facilities. And these facilities discharge their wastewater into the Santa Cruz River. And due to the lack of running surface water, nine months out of the year, this river is 100% wastewater. So it was important to see the contaminants coming out of the treatment plants. And we wanted to see if um, these contaminants were being transported down with the riverbed. We also measured wells lying along the river to see if the groundwater was being influenced by these chemicals. So what are these? chemicals. Uh, these are contaminants that are called emerging contaminants. They're emerging because, uh, you know, they may have already been there, but it's, it's emerging because um, we're just starting to figure out what they are and what they're doing. And so um, at the time, I, I was studying endocrine disrupting chemicals. These are pollutants that are that interact with human hormones or other living organisms hormonal system and can cause disruption in these biochemical pathways. And these chemicals are present at concentrations that can have an impact on these uh, physiological systems. So I took a, uh, report, a bioassay and measured wastewater, measured the hormones present in wastewater. And we saw that hormones are not removed during wastewater treatment. And then in the lower right, we also showed that uh, wells lying along the Santa Cruz River were being impacted by wastewater, which is this blue dotted line, as well as we found that um, there were estrogens present in this water. And so the estrogens are also responsible for um, causing aquatic animals to turn from male to female. And so um, it's really interesting um, to see that um, wastewater can cause um, or can have such high concentrations of these pollutants. And so this, uh, this is the type of research you know, that really excited me um, to look for pollutants that can have impacts on living organisms. So how do we treat them? How can we get rid of them? Um, and where are they ending up? And then in my postdoc, I talked about the metal resistance in E. coli. And in my early faculty days, I kind of you know, reshaped that and switched to antibiotic resistance in E. coli. And so uh, why was this important? Um, well, I found uh, in some of my early work that E. coli was actually resistant to human hormones um, on some level. And that has implications in wastewater treatment. 
During wastewater treatment, there's a process where we need bacteria to break down these chemicals. And so we rely on stuff like E. coli and some other pathogens, or not pathogens, some other microbes to break down that waste. But if we have something called antibiotic resistance, and in this mechanism in particular, what the bacteria does is just take the chemical, they'll see you know, an antibiotic or some other chemical and just spit it out of the cell. What we actually need the bacteria to do is to take that chemical and break it down. But this efflux mechanism is really limiting that um, biodegradation. And so I received funding from NSF uh, to look at why these human hormones and other emerging contaminants were not being broken down during wastewater treatment. And so we're doing, currently still doing work on um, what is the role of this um, efflux pump when it comes to wastewater bacteria. And, and so this was also interesting. Um, I like that it merged you know, my graduate work with my uh, postdoc work. And it, without that postdoc experience of exploring another field, you know, I wouldn't have made a link between these two areas. Another um, area I'm very passionate about is tribal uh, environmental engineering. So tribal drinking water, tribal wastewater. Uh, a few years ago, we pulled some data from an EPA website called ECHO, which is Enforcement and Compliance History Online, which uh, collects data from all public water, wastewater, hazardous waste, solid waste, um, and air facilities and monitoring stations. And you can uh, search in your own community to look at the uh, data that's coming out um, with respect to any of these areas. So I wanted to look at drinking water in particular. So we looked at a three-year data set that focused on Safe Drinking Water Act violations in tribal drinking water systems. And on this website, we're able to look at the tribe, um, location of the facility, uh, how many people they serve, and then it'll tell you if there were any Safe Drinking Water Act violations. And so uh, what we saw is that there were more uh, drinking water violations in tribal public water than in non-tribal public water. And this was due to um, violations of um, uh, contaminant uh, levels present in water. So for example, um, they would find more E. coli present in tribal public water systems than in non-tribal public water systems. Um, but this was, um, this looked at all 90 or so drinking water contaminants, as well as some um, Safe Drinking Water Act rules. Also, we saw that um, tribes were less likely to monitor and or report um, drinking water violations or drinking water um, levels. And uh, this was attributed to limited staff um, that have to cover large areas of a reservation, um, perhaps notifying the public of when a, a Drinking Water Act violation occurs. And so there were multiple factors that played into this disparity of Drinking Water Act violation points. I'm also um, still in, in the emerging contaminant world. Uh, so uh, I'm looking at the contaminants on the un UCMR unregulated, unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. This is also under EPA, where they're monitoring 30 um, unregulated contaminants nationwide um, for uh, a five-year period. And this started uh, late 1990s. I think they started collecting data in the early 2000s. So UCMR1 had 30 chemicals covering insecticides, herbicides, organic precursors, and so forth. Um, UCMR2 had uh, brominated flame retardants, 
nitrosamines, which are formed during disinfection. UCMR3 had PFAS, um, which is an environmental concern, hormones, other metals. And UCMR4 has uh, cyanotoxins, pesticides, uh, semi-volatiles, and indicators. So all of this data is publicly available. Uh, you can go onto the respective UCMR website and um, look up the data for your public water facility if it was collected. This, this was just a general survey. They didn't um, attest all public waters of the US. So I pulled the data for tribe, tribes um, and tribal public water system. And under UCMR one and two, uh, all public water um, uh, samples that were measured were less than the detection limit. When I got to UCMR3, that's where we started to see uh, a little bit more uh, tangible data that we could analyze. So under UCMR3 for tribal public water, uh, what we found were dioxane, PFAS, or PFAS in this case, different metals and chlorate that were measured above the drinking water standard, not drinking water standard, that were a detection limit in tribal water. And for UCMR4, um, they measured haloacetic acids, manganese, and germanium. Since these are unregulated, there is no drinking water standard. Um, in some cases, there might be a health reference limit shown here, which is just the recommended limit to stay below for um, exposure purposes. But nothing is um, uh, given an official um, maximum contaminant limit just yet. And so what does this mean? Um, if any of these contaminants were to become regulated uh, federally, um, many drinking water facilities nationwide would have to deal with um, that issue either um, upgrading their facilities, you know, finding an alternative to um, meet the drinking water standard for that contaminant. And this would definitely have an impact in tribal drinking water. Um, I also look at um, computer modeling of these contaminants and how they interact with different human uh, proteins in the body. So this is called in silico modeling. And this is a, a good way to test for the potential biochemical activity of a contaminant. And so a few years ago, we looked at bisphenol. Uh, bisphenol is an issue because um, it is an endocrine disrupting chemical. And once that was discovered, uh, a lot of our plastics converted from BPA to non-BPA, but the chemical that replaced it was just another type of bisphenol. And so I looked at a series of bisphenols um, and saw that uh, many of the bisphenols were uh, estrogens. They interact with the estrogen system um, on a computer model. And then they also uh, interact with the androgen system, which is predominantly found in males uh, as well. Um, and so we followed this up with uh, a lab test and we verified these computer results. And so for that same UCMR list of chemicals, 100 or so chemicals, they put all of those in uh, this computer model that we use to see if any of these unregulated chemicals are endocrine disruptors. This is a paper we're working on now. On the left-hand side shows uh, the chemicals that we were able to measure about 96 or so. And the brighter the color, the more strongly it binds to a nuclear receptor um, a computerized nuclear receptor in the human body. So this is in this analysis, we're looking at androgens, estrogens, glutocorticoid, thyroid, um, as well as metabolic disruptors. So there were a number of these that, number of these chemicals that are potential endocrine disruptors. But we also wanted to see if these chemicals were found in public water systems. So we extracted all that EPA data and we plotted the toxic potential of these chemicals with the prevalence found in public water systems. And there are concerns over some of um, these chemicals. 
Um, we have a lot of um, brominated um, haloacetic acids, which are disinfection byproducts. Um, they were found in a lot of different public water systems, but they don't really interact with any of these um, biochemical pathways. And so we have, really have to think about, do they interact elsewhere in the body? And then we have the, the other end of things where there were chemicals that have high toxicity, but they were found in only a few drinking water systems. And so um, when it comes to regulation, um, you know, EPA has work ahead of itself. Uh, you know, what are the chemicals that are going to be regulated next and at what levels? Um, and then where are these chemicals found in the U.S.? And lastly, um, I want to talk about um, one of my larger projects, which is wastewater-based epidemiology, uh, and specifically as it pertains to health monitoring in tribal communities. So uh, in wastewater-based epidemiology, we're collecting wastewater from a sewer shed that services um, some municipality, some public um, water system. And we collect that wastewater before it reaches the wastewater treatment plant. So we're collecting it um, basically, I think of it as it comes out of the toilet or on its way to the wastewater treatment facility. Then it makes its way to the treatment facility and it gets discharged. So uh, we looked at all of the um, wastewater discharge permits in tribal communities and that's shown on the map. And why we did this was because we wanna um, target tribes or invite tribes or even see if they're interested in doing this type of work for community health monitoring. And so in wastewater-based epidemiology, we're collecting uh, human waste and measuring different chemicals. We can measure um, drugs of abuse. We can measure contaminant exposure um, if you've been exposed to a pesticide or we can measure maybe infectious disease of a population. Um, of the uh, 574 tribes, about 100 have centralized sewer treatment in the US that uh, we were able to find in public databases. So not all tribes could do this type of work for community health monitoring. Um, with these tribes, it's also important to see if they are, are supportive of this type of work or if they have uh, any research policies that do allow this type of work or don't allow this type of work. So this was just the first step, just checking to see who has um, public wastewater, centralized wastewater facilities. So uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages to looking at wastewater monitoring of a community. Well, we can rapidly assess a population. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, chemicals, um, you know, we, if we have a method developed, we can quantify that analyte within a few days. Same with infectious disease or contaminant exposure. This is anonymized in that we're not um, you know, pinpointing individuals. Uh, when it comes to drugs of abuse. It's non-invasive sampling. Um, we're not you know, directly correct collecting urine or blood or hair or nail samples. Um, some disadvantages. Uh, one, we don't really know what the sewer layout of a tribal system is unless we go out there and inspect it ourselves. So that's really my role on these projects is to assess tribal wastewater infrastructure. And in doing so, we do have to be careful because sewage contains human pathogens. We do have to get additional immunizations for certain, against certain human diseases. In this analysis, we also need to know how many people are contributing to that sewer line. And so many population estimates are unknown. And then if your sewer rate fluctuates, uh, that can impact the results. You can imagine if we have a lot of sewer flowing in, that could dilute out the signal and give us a result that we weren't expecting. On the right shows what we do in the field. 
uh, we have these wastewater auto samplers, well, not wastewater, water auto samplers that we pre-programmed to collect over 24 hours. And uh, most of the wastewater facilities in Indian country are lagoons. With lagoons, um, wastewater is pumped in and it gets diluted. And so we really can't collect from that point. So we have to collect upstream any sewer line. And so we'll um, put one of these auto samplers in a manhole and suspend it, uh, pre-program it, and then come back 24 hours later and collect that wastewater sample. And so this brings up another issue. Uh, I mentioned it in the um, slide before, is how do we work with tribes in this type of work? Because this is, you know, we're the first lab in the country to do wastewater monitoring in a tribal community. Um, regardless, it's very important that uh, we follow tribal research protocols. Um, so in the upper left is really our approach to doing wastewater-based epidemiology research in tribal communities. We first get that approval. We apply for IRB or research board um, or submit an application packet to the, their health committee. Um, before and get approval um, before doing any type of work. That's absolutely necessary. And uh, in that process, we discover, you know, what are their policies on sampling of water um, or doing environmental work? Uh, what's the policy with looking at microbes? Um, and what, ch what chemicals can we or can't we measure? And so once we get all of that in writing, uh, once the IRB is approved or the, tribal, the tribe uh, passes a resolution, we can then go out and get our funding. And all of our projects go through ASU's Tribal Research Review Policy, where uh, there's a committee. Um, if there's anything tribal related, they will go through the entire proposal and approve or not approve that project. And if IRB is needed uh, at the institution, um, then that uh, has to be taken care of at that point. So once all your approvals are set, uh, we then coordinate with the tribal utility. I'll make a trip out there and look at the wastewater infrastructure, set up a sampling plan, um, and then coordinate sampling. We'll take those samples back here, um, analyze them, and then um, we, acknowledge that uh, tribes have the right to the data that is collected um, within their boundaries uh, or using their natural resources or from their tribal members. So we, uh, it's ASC's policy to give um, all results back to the tribe. And so um, in this uh, pandemic or even in the um, drug abuse um, pandemic that tribes are encountering. Uh, we're going through all of these at different stages. Um, and the lower right shows the number of tribes that we're currently working with or we've inquired with. Um, and so we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. So about 13 tribes um, currently that we are either working with or they have expressed interest or that we've approached and they've said they have no interest in this type of work. Um, and they're uh, where they are in the policy. Um, you know, a few tribes have tribal resolutions where we present to tribal council. Um, a few tribes have an IRB process. One tribe exempted us from IRB because of the anonymity of uh, wastewater. And then there was one tribe, um, and I'm sure this is like this in a number of other tribes that they do not have a research policy. And so at this time they, they're interested, but they cannot do this type of work until they um, uh, work with their legal team on what is in the best interest of their tribe. And then there are a number of other tribes where they're interested, but um, navigating through that research approval process is currently unknown. And so, um, you know, this type of work is both health related as well as environmental related. So we're working with a lot of different entities. Um, we're at the point where we're collecting a lot of data 
And now we need to translate that back to the community. But what I wanna do is share one of our projects. Um, this is a project where we're looking at drugs of abuse in six different tribal communities. And this is with my collaborator, Dr. Ralph Baldwin, who's also in wastewater based epidemiology. And so we received um, approval to look at uh, drugs in these six different communities because of the ongoing opioid crisis and then some other fluctuating um, substance abuse regulations that were going on with this tribe. And so this is using um, mass spectrometry to quantify uh, drugs as well as their analytes. So we really were targeting those analytes because they've passed through the human body. And so we know that people have ingested them. Uh, but we also have to uh, measure that parent compound as well. So we're measuring um, you know, over-the-counter drugs, recreational, prescription, opioids, as well as illicit substances. And in the uh, results on the right-hand side, uh, we're basically measuring all of the chemicals that were targeted at different levels. The y-axis shows you know, many orders of magnitude difference. Um, so some communities were not finding a lot of drug use and then in some communities we're really finding um, substantial drug use. And so um, per our policy, uh, we gave these results back to the tribe and now we're looking at additional funding to continue this work. And so where this is really having an impact is in the COVID pandemic. Um, so uh, the pandemic has really impacted our uh, tribal communities. And since the start of the pandemic, the American Indian population have had uh, generally higher case counts as well as deaths uh, compared to um, other races. Uh, when it comes to um, coronavirus. And um, for uh, vaccination status, this is IHS data from uh, early September. Uh, community transmission continues to be high in the US. Uh, over 59% of the native adult population um, has had at least one vaccine, nearly 50%, probably over 50% by now are fully vaccinated. Um, and it's really important that um, this, uh, all this data gets reported, um, that uh, we try to um, uh, get vaccines to our communities because we're seeing just you know, that high death rate, um, we're seeing, um, you know, our elders that are suffering from this and in some cases loss of, you know, that traditional knowledge and that um, uh, language and, and our culture that are, are being lost due to deaths. Um, and so uh, with that, we were hoping to um, see if we can use this wastewater-based epidemiology tool to track coronavirus infections in our tribal communities. And so um, that's where we are working in that previous slide with the table with um, you know, 13 or so tribes to um, monitor trends monthly. Um, and now we're moving on to sequencing the coronavirus to see which variants are present. So in this way, we just collect from the entire community we can look at from month to month if um, we're seeing increases in coronavirus or decreases and currently um, the communities are trending up again. Um, and then also um, the uh, sequencing and then getting that data back to the tribe is key to our project. So this is uh, some sample data from two of our tribal communities where we collect that 24 hour sample um, on the right hand side um, and then quantify coronavirus with qPCR. And you'll see that the, just based on sewer levels, um, when people use uh, their facilities, we do get variations in coronavirus signal in wastewater coming from these tribal communities. Also depending on the size of the community, um, you may see higher concentrations or lower concentrations. 
So when we compare all of these data, we really can only compare that community to, community to itself. And so we look at a temporal trend within that community. And then on the left-hand side shows a comparison of two of these communities um, starting back in May um, where we weren't detecting coronavirus. That was kind of like at the, the low point of the pandemic or before one of the uh, phases hit again. And then we're on that upswing again. Uh, hopefully these numbers are coming down with our next sample rounds. Um, but uh, that's where we're taking wastewater-based epidemiology is to help, um, you know, track pandemics. Some tribes have asked, you know, can we also do this with the flu? Um, and people are doing that, uh, are measuring flu uh, with uh, this approach. Um, the, we can basically measure any, uh, you know, micro present in wastewater. And so it's also important for tribes to realize that, you know, when they do enter in these types of agreements to really outline and specify what can and can't be measured. Um, we don't want to start measuring, you know, infectious disease that could bring, that could stigmatize the tribe, for example. Um, and so in all of our agreements thus far, we are only measuring um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then for the drugs, we only measure the drugs that are present or um, identified in that previous slide. Okay, with that, um, that summarizes my work. And I wanna say pilamaya. That is a thank you and Lakota. I have many partners here at ASU. Um, other faculty members, um, the president's office, uh, I work with the Intertribal Council of Arizona and their um, network of uh, 22 tribes, and then our funding. And then if you are interested for your community, or if you, if you think your um, health director or wastewater managers are interested in this type of work, whether it be the epidemiology or even just measuring different contaminants, um, please share my information. Okay, um, I will take questions. I don't know if we want to go through the chat list of questions. Um, I think. Yes, let's let's go ahead and do that. Thank you so much, Bravo. This is I'm really really beyond impressed and just so so amazed that all the work that you do for and with community. It sounds like you're very involved and committed in really, really looking at the, not only the interdisciplinary work that you do in STEM, within the STEM fields, but addressing social issues in such a timely and, um, you know, perfect timing. I'm going to let my colleagues um, maybe help me with some of these questions, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, you can see them in the chat, Dr. Conroy Ben. Um, yeah. So the first one is from Andrea Camunes. Uh, Andrea Camunes, are there specific grants or scholarships available to promote AIAN uh, students in entering STEM? Um, I would say to take a look at uh, organizations that support um, students entering STEM, so ACIF as well as SACNIS. There may be scholarships at your institution. Um, and there could also just be other general um, uh, scholarships um, from different organizations. And so you would need to uh, take a look and do some research. I can go ahead. Um, so the next question is, where are where there are any degree programs where Alaska AIAN were more represented than they are in these specific degrees? So the um, database I pulled from was a very large national database, but I uh, went through the National Science Foundation where they uh, disaggregated specifically science engineering and then non-science engineering. Um, so um, 
that data may be out there somewhere. Yeah, we would just have to look at the um, raw data sets. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure about that question. Okay, the next one came from Kayla and it said the summary, so an earlier summary that you presented, says that there is not enough data to break it down into male and female, but is there uh, any statistics that show that one gender is more likely, I guess, to, to obtain degrees than the other gender? Um, let's see. So for that slide, I believe that was a faculty summary slide, um, but the data set from uh, uh, that I used does have a gender breakdown. Um, so that um, is discipline specific. You know, engineering is generally still more male, but in environmental engineering, it is more female. Um, so we would have just have to look at the specific um, discipline, but the data is there. It's impressive the data that you shared in terms of faculty representation and student population at ASU um, and this student is asking um, what school currently has the largest American Indian population with students and faculty, I guess, representation. Right. Um, so I want to say ASU does have the largest faculty um, in public uh, institutions. Uh, I don't know the data for tribal colleges. Um, and especially with the student body count. Um, as far as public institutions, ASU has um, the most students and faculty. If, if I might jump in, the American Indian Sciences and Engineering Society has a journal, uh, Winds of Change, the magazine for the uh, organization. And they put out uh, periodically a guide to universities and colleges that has data on uh, who has the most um, students, different factors that figure into um, the higher um, majors, numbers and majors. So the last one I saw was from the 2018-2019 year. So you can look that up under the American Indian Sciences and Engineering Society. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is um, from my Mariposa 78. This is so important that students see themselves represented in the faculty, especially in STEM. Kudos to ASU. Okay, the next one uh, from memory. A lot of people are not aware of why we celebrate Indigenous Day or the impact of being an Indigenous student slash person. How can we make it known to others, not just in schools, but as a community? I think that, that that question, that student is in my class and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're talking about justice, issues of justice and the importance of addressing inequities, especially in schools and communities that surround NMSU. <laughs> so I think that that is where that question may be coming. Great question, Memory. I'll try to answer it on, on Monday next week. Um, and, and again, Memory says, I feel like today doesn't receive the recognition it deserves. Mm -hmm. um, I'm only asking because in my previous class with this was Spanish and not even my professor knew about today. Uh, and she's a Mexican woman with other cultures as well. And, and like not even our own people know about a day that celebrates us. Then Flash Guy asks, do other states have a bill or proposal to introduce Indigenous Peoples Day in place or alongside Columbus Day, if so, when? And then I posted a link um, for them on, on, on uh, YouTube. So that's been answered. Go ahead.
Hey, I'll go jump in. Uh, a question was asked, how long was your research when you were in graduate school to see the water quality of different, I believe, neighborhoods and cities? Um, so my research was six years, um, but that was master's and PhD. And so, you know, dissertation is a big endeavor. Um, whatever you're working on will take years of data collection. Um, and even, you know, to be respectful of the community, and you want to see trends and make recommendations, you really need to um, do a statistically significant study where you are collecting data for a while. Okay, now that I found my place. Um, the work that you do is interconnected to social justice issues and is intersectional. Bravo, Dr. Conroy Ben. So more of a, more of a, of a reaffirming statement there. Thank you. And then the next one is, does New Mexico, I, does NMED have oversight ultimately or does the tribe, I guess in terms of the research that you're doing, collecting? Um, yes, I don't work with any New Mexico tribes, but I'm guessing the tribe has authority. Okay, so the next comment, uh, Adeline Karina, uh, it's awful that tribal water is not the same quality of that of non-tribal community water is. Is there anything being done to draw more attention to this issue or any progress in solving the problem? So in that particular study, um, there were tribes with better water quality than the surrounding public, um, but overall tribal water quality was worse. And it was worse in the Western United States where there are issues with infrastructure. So rural communities with, um, uh, with lack of public water, uh, piping, um, indoor plumbing and so forth. Um, so that is one of the factors. Is there anything being done? Um, the uh, CARES Act funding uh, within the past couple of years that was distributed distributed to tribes uh, in some cases was used to uh, improve interest infrastructure, um, but there was a time limit on that and you can't get tribal projects approved and done and get contractors out within what was given by the federal government. Um, and so I think the pandemic brought out a lot of these issues, even though we kind of knew they were there before. Uh, so there are uh, current plans on some reservations, at least in Arizona, to you know, try to improve the water quality and sanitation. Okay, I've got a question from David. How is the quality of water affecting the ecosystem in the tribal lands? Yeah, so that is not my area of specialty. And I don't know that, um, tribal environmental departments are looking at that uh, simply because um, you know, a lot of their work is prioritized. And so federally, it would be drinking water, um, wastewater discharge, and then that would be it. Um, you know, are they complying with those? And so you know, when I brought up, you know, let's look at these contaminants, those contaminants, the tribal utility or environmental um, committee, they come back and say, oh, we, we, we're not interested in that type of work, or we don't have funding for that type of work. Um, so unless the tribe, um, you know, has funding to do that type of work, I don't know that um, those answers would be there. I'll ask, I'll ask uh, two questions. <laughs> One is, have you worked with uh, NEPA in your career? And then the other one is, how have your projects been affected by the pandemic, if at all? Okay, um, I have not worked with, it's NEPA um, in my career, I have not. Um, let's see, and how have been affected by the pandemic. Okay, yes, so ASU shut down spring break of 2020 and they shut down all labs as well. 
And it wasn't until trying to, this pandemic's been so long of getting my years mixed up. Um, I want to say it was at least six to eight months before they allowed uh, lab research to resume. Um, and then uh, they allowed people back on campus, you know, probably about a year later um, for in person. And so my projects were all on hold. But um, they did uh, give some exceptions to some labs. So my collaborator who started up the coronavirus monitoring, his lab was still operating. So we started sending our samples there. Okay, the next question. How did you navigate graduate school and how important were your non-STEM courses in, in sustaining you and helping you thrive? Okay, so I had non-STEM courses in undergrad, and I would say that those were definitely challenging, but, you know, where they helped me um, even today was in the writing, um, you know, in critical thinking, in presentation and communication. And so um, those are where, you know, where I drew my uh, uh, non-scientific skills from. Um, so it's definitely important that you learn how to write a paper, how to present, how to work as a team, um, and then how to, uh, you know, just deal with different personality types, because um, you're going to experience all of that in whatever field you get into. The next question is from Megan. What do you think the most impactful part of your work has been so far on you personally? or a community you served? Um, let's see, I would say it's working with tribal communities. Um, in the field I'm in, um, as I climb the academic ladder, uh, I'm expected to you know, publish and be proficient technically. And little credit is given to your work with, um, uh, communities, whether it be urban communities or tribal communities or black communities. Um, that is not important when it is in science and engineering as a faculty member. So I was actually told to not do any tribal work pre-tenure. Um, but um, and there are reasons for that um, because it does take a long time to develop relationships with tribes in that time when you should be publishing or developing a research program. Um, but I've been fortunate that I've been able to blend the two and I've had an institution where that it's starting to get recognized. And so I would say that is probably the most impactful for me personally um, and even technically to um, work with a number of different tribes that I do, um, like working directly with them and then um, also doing it in a way that, um, that you know, I can share the work with the science community. I'm gonna ask uh, questions that, one, it was partially answered by one of our colleagues. <laughs> I'm gonna ask Rafael's question, uh, which was partially answered by Christopher Brown. What are some steps that institutions like universities can take to be more supportive to their indigenous staff, faculty, and students? How can they contribute to their success? To which Chris Brown says, I share an idea to answer Rafael Loera's question. Central administration must make a commitment to hire indigenous staff, mm -hmm. faculty as a specific action in universities, diversity, equity, and inclusion agendas. And I must advocate for those that are already here and we work to retain them. We have to do that. Yeah, I agree. Um, definitely. I, I First off, I couldn't do the work that I do if I were at another institution, um, because I do have a lot of support administratively. Um, but I also have colleagues um, that I work with, and that Native community is really, really important. Um, and so you do need that institutional commitment, um, not only for a uh, faculty, staff, but for the students. Um, 
you know, students are, are dealing with a lot, the pandemic with family issues, stress. Um, and so it's, it's really important to listen to the students and um, you know, provide that, that environment for them. Can't hear you. The next one is what are some actions that the individuals can take to support indigenous people to succeed in college and work? Very informative and interesting presentation. Thank you. To support indigenous people to succeed in college and work. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, I, I think just, you know, being respectful uh, of everyone, including, including Native um, perspectives and Native students. Um, yeah, I've been in situations where I didn't feel that and I was very unhappy where I was. And so if, if there's not that collegial or, or supportive environment, um, it can be really hard and it can really be isolating for the student or your coworker. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, uh, uh, share, be nice, supportive, um, uh, listen to other, other perspectives uh, and so forth. Maybe the others can chime in. We're working hard right now to just retain the very few, very few faculty that we have mm -hmm. that are critical BIPOC faculty here at NMSU. And um, with this newly instituted Office for Equity, Inclusion and Diversity, we hope that we can get some, some uh, progress going. <laughs> but more importantly, I think there's an urgent need to retain um, faculty as amazing as they are as Dr. Badoni and um, Dr. Jeanette haynes Ryder. I mean, can literally count them in one hand, <laughs> the native faculty that we have which is horrible because we are in New Mexico um, and we are an HSI, MSI. Um, I don't know if others want to chime in on that. Um, I, I would say it's, it's the importance of recognizing that uh, for, for many, you know, Native students and faculty, the reason we get our degrees isn't for ourselves, but it's for our communities, it's for our extended family. So as we think about um, you know, what does that mean for an academic program? As, as Dr. Conroy Ben said, she was told, you know, early on not to participate in, in community, but as we're setting up science programs, the academic degree programs, are there places for students to see themselves to improve quality of life for their communities or to give back? So it may, it has to be a shift for the institution itself. Thank you. Thank you, I agree. Um, going to uh, the next question, what variables affect the reason one tribe may be prone to drug use than others? Um, I'm not sure I'm not a, a substance abuse um, researcher. And so, um, I would say, you know, in our work, um, you know, location, you know, proximity to, are they rural or is it more, is it closer to an urban community? Um, the the socioeconomic uh, structure of the tribe. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what else would, would um, contribute to those differences. Now a question from our American Indian program director, Michael Ray. As we move to improve our higher education systems, in your opinion, as a professor, what can our administrators do to help more professors engage students in a positive way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, let's see, to help more professors engage students in a positive way. Um, it's, I find it's 
challenging with professors, um, specifically in my field, who are, um, you know, they think uh, very linearly. Um, and as far as student success, um, you know, I've encountered professors who are not very flexible when, um, especially during a critical time like right now, uh, students need that. Um, and so I think that um, maybe just communicate to the professors more on, on the different, the needs of the different populations on the campus. Okay, for the next one from Alexandra. How long do tribal communities take to re review the IRB approval you need to continue your work? Yeah, so that varies. Um, I inquired with one tribe and I got a no within hours. And then uh, I've been working with one tribe um, Actually, a few tribes where I submitted an IRB and it does take about four or five months just to go through review and, and get approvals. Um, and then, you know, some tribes, you actually have to start that communication long before that. You need to establish that you are a respectful researcher, um, that you have the best interests of the tribe. Uh, um, you're thinking about that, um, making those connections. So it could take, you know, years even, I would say. Thank you. And this is the last question from Aaron. You mentioned issues regarding the well being of tribal communities. My question is not targeted to STEM, but what are some huge cultural implications of continuing with these problems in the long term? Okay, um, so I'm thinking this has to do with like the water, wastewater quality in, in tribal communities. Um, some cultural implications long term. We are seeing more of these pollutants in the environment that are in, uh, disrupting. Um, metabolic processes. So what does that mean? So we have contaminants that could be contributing to heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure. Um, and that is uh, really coming to light now um, with, you know, discovering more preconditions, pre, um, the condition, conditions that impact uh, COVID outcomes. Um, and so cultural implications um, how does this could impact um, just the overall health of communities? Um, it could impact the like the ecological health. Are we going to impact you know where water sources come from, or are we going to uh, impact infrastructure and and a tribes um, resources? Um, so we really have to think about all these things, and so. Um, that requires collaboration from all of the engineers, from tribal elders, uh, from uh, the tribe itself, and uh, to really pinpoint how these are going to impact the community. Um, so we have, you know, the pandemic, um, looking at pandemic preparedness, um, what were the outcomes of the pandemic, uh, climate change, um, that are looking uh, all, of, all of these different, um, you know, disciplines that are looking at long-term impacts um, that um, that will impact these communities. This has been a, a wonderful um, talk, uh, Dr. Conray Ben, and I'm just so honored that you accepted the invitation, uh, especially because of the importance of today's uh, observation of Indigenous Peoples Day. And I really appreciated the connections that you made to the social issues and the, um, the, the thinking, <laughs> the critical thinking that has to be enacted when working with and for communities, especially tribal communities. I really appreciated that. And um, that connection to 
uh, addressing <laughs> why we need to see faculty like yourself on, on campuses that are HSI, MSI, especially like, M like NMSU specifically, who are, that are also land grant universities. Um, I really, really appreciate your time and all that you share with us today. I don't know if my colleagues want to share any, any other words. I'm just very um, thankful to to have you speak to us and in, in on the important topic of science uh, in and sharing your journey. Um, you have, um, I think, provided us all of us, professors, students, uh, community people, just you know, being able to glean from what you shared about your own uh, journey and trajectory, so that um, others can uh, see the value in science and tribal communities, but also to obtain their degrees. So uh, with gratitude, uh, thank you for, for speaking to us today. Thank you. Yes, I wanna say thank you again, Ikeha, for um, sharing your narrative, your, your, your journey with us and um, the kind words that you know, our students and here, you know, faculty at NMSU can, can take with us and kind of recharge and, and uh, do this work that we, we are doing as we move forward. Thank you, Ikeha. Thank you. With that, um, we look forward to seeing you at other events. Um, we have a celebration of um, honoring the people that have passed on, Dia de los Muertos on November 2nd, um, hosted by Kappa Delta Chi. <laughs> and we will have a showing of the movie Coco. Um, and we will have an explanation of what Dia de los Muertos is, which is not Halloween. Um, and then, um, we look forward to seeing you at other events that are um, sponsored by the Office for Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity. Buenas tardes. Have a great uh, afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.